Greetings and welcome to this live embedded event talk. Today I'll be talking about uh, all things related to graphics with the Linux kernel and user space components. So the idea is to kind of draw an overview of all these different components and how they work together and what they do specifically. So let me switch back to my slides here. All right. First, a few words about myself. Um, I'm Paul Kosolkowski, and I'm an embedded Linux engineer working at Butlin. So Butlin is a company uh, that works on uh, Linux kernel driver development as well as bootloader development. Uh, but we also do uh, training, especially online these days. So uh, if you have needs in terms of uh, Linux or bootloader development, uh, you can definitely call us and we take uh, various projects from lots of different customers to kind of help them uh, in these areas. And Bootlin also cares a lot about free and open source software. So we try and contribute uh, as much as possible uh, the work that we do in the upstream projects. So personally, I've been working on the uh, hardware video decoder for Arduino devices in mainline Linux. So this is the Cydrus driver in V4L2. Um, I've also worked on the DRM driver for Arduino platforms, uh, which is called sun 4 i DRM. It's responsible for display. And um, I've also been working more recently on MyPy CSI2 support for Arduino platforms again. So that's a camera interface. Uh, and I've also developed and I'm giving a training about um, graphics with Linux uh, and user space. So this is the displaying and rendering graphics with Linux training. OK, so let's begin this talk with a bit of an introduction about graphics in general. So what do we really mean by graphics? Well, first of all, graphics really, really deals with representing light. So this is just a way to um, represent pictures digitally. And pictures are really just a representation of light. So a synonym for pictures that I'm going to be using is frames. So frames and pictures really mean the same thing. So the idea is that we want to represent light. Uh, digitally, so since it's digital, we have a finite number of um, elements that compose our picture. And so these elements are called pixels for picture elements. And um, the idea is that we're going to represent the colors of each pixel uh, using numbers. So that's a digital representation again. And the way to do this is to define first what we call a color model which is just a base for representing the pixels. So the most common one is uh, red, green, and blue, RGB. So we have three channels. Uh, and then there is the color space, which is basically a matching uh, between the value of each uh, channel of the color model to an actual uh, light value. So the color space is really the link between the physical world and uh, the digital representation, while the color model is kind of uh, a system for representing uh, the different components of each color. Oh, so let me remove myself from this one. Um, <clears throat> Now, if we want to characterize pictures, uh, there are a few um, properties that we can uh, look at. The first one and the most obvious is the dimensions of the pictures. So that's the width and the height. Then once we have these dimensions, we can calculate the aspect ratio, uh, something like uh, 16 to 9 or 4 to 3. Uh, these are quite common aspect ratios. So. This is basically the geometry of the picture. Then there is something called the resolution, which is often confused with the dimensions, but it's really something else. So the resolution is basically the link between the uh, number of pixels and a, uh, an actual physical length unit. So for example, uh, in American countries, that would be the uh, number of pixels per inches. But in European countries, there would be number of pixels per millimeter, for example. Then another thing that is quite important about 
uh, pictures is uh, how they, the pixels are stored in memory. So there is a specific order in which the pixels are stored uh, so that it's possible to uh, correctly interpret the picture. So this is called the scan order. And the most common one is called uh, linear scan order or raster scan order. And this is just the idea that we're going to, to read the pixels um, line after line in memory. So this is starting from the top. And then we have each line uh, in memory one after the other. Uh, but pixels also have a specific format. So the format is really the description of how um, how each pixel individually is described. So I've already mentioned the uh, color model and color space. So this is one thing that makes the format. Then we can also have uh, an, uh, another channel that we call the alpha channel uh, to store uh, per pixel transparency information. Then there is the idea of uh, depth and bits per pixel. So the number of bits per pixel is just basically how many bits it takes in memory to represent a single pixel. So this might be aligned to a byte, or it may also not be aligned to a byte. And this will also count the alpha channel. Now when we talk about depth, usually we exclude the alpha channel and we're only considering the uh, actual color components. So we might have different values between the two. Then another thing that is quite important is how the, uh, each uh, color channel is organized in memory. So for example, in RGB, it's quite common that we have um, the red information, then green, then blue in memory, and this goes on for every pixel. But it's also possible that we have, for example, all the reds, and then all the greens, and then all the blues. So this is quite important to know if you want to properly decode the picture. Now, uh, finally, something else that we kind of need to know to correctly understand pixels is uh, the subsampling factors. So subsampling is generally the idea that uh, we're going to share one of the channel information for different pixels. So this is especially useful for the YUV color models where we have a separation between the uh, color components and the luminance components. So luminance is kind of uh, how bright each pixel should be, and the chrominance uh, are the two other channels which just bring the color information. Now because the human eye is more sensitive to luminosity than it is to color difference, it's possible to actually use one value for a a uh, small number of pixels, like two or four pixels, uh, in the chroma channel. So we actually have less information of color than we have of luminosity. And usually this doesn't make a very big difference for the human eye, because uh, this is just how sensitive we are. Okay, so now we kind of have some idea about pictures and, and pixels. Um, and let's try to look at all the different kinds of hardware or devices that might deal with pixels. So there are basically two main categories for this. Uh, the first one would be graphics, and it uh, contains the following things. So first of all, we have displaying pictures. So this is just using a screen like a monitor or a panel, but it might also be a projector. Uh, and the idea is just to basically reproduce light from these digital representations. So that's what we're going to be interested in uh, at the end of uh, the graphics pipeline. Then the second type of, of graphics device would be rendering device. Um, the idea is that we want to generate digital pictures uh, basically from... Uh, from uh, information like equations or uh, what we call primitives. So that would be points, lines, triangles, and so on. So this is what is used for 3D rendering and also for uh, drawing in 2D or drawing fonts and things like this. So we basically have a representation of, for example, the font. Uh, that could be a vector font which will basically give you the information of the path that should be followed to draw the font. Uh, 
And so then the, the rendering device or rendering implementation will uh, draw the pixels that match uh, this path. Then we have another type of, uh, of thing that we can do in graphics, and that's processing. So the idea of processing is that we want to uh, modify something in a picture or uh, we want to transform it more generally. So an example of this uh, would be, for example, compositing, where we take multiple pictures and we put them together. Um, for example, the green screen method, where you put a green screen behind someone and then you remove the green and you put a different picture uh, instead of the green. That's an example of compositing. But also um, creating a single picture from the different buffers, the different pictures, the different frames of applications is also uh, an example of compositing. There are more examples uh, like scaling, uh, if you want to resize a picture, uh, converting, if you want to change its format, and finally filtering, which is a quite general uh, way to uh, transform digital pictures. So you can use it for blurring, for example. You can use it to uh, make the edges make the edges sharper. You can use it for lots of different things. And then there is a, another category uh, of of things that deal with pixels, which I'm not going to mention uh, anymore in this presentation. Uh, so that's a media part. So what I mean by media is first uh, decoding and encoding pictures. So that could be static pictures uh, like we know with JPEG or PNG, for example. Uh, but this might also be uh, video encoding and decoding with formats like H.264 or VP8, for example. Now, another kind of, of uh, media uh, thing that we can do is uh, capturing or outputting pixels. So capturing would be, for example, using a camera. That's just a, a physical device that will provide pixels uh, from the physical world, let's say. Uh, you can also receive, uh, I don't know, like television with DVB. Uh, so yeah, all, all sort of things like this, which are about capturing, but also Outputting, so if you want to transmit uh, your own TV show, for example, that would be uh, an example of outputting. So in this presentation, we're only going to focus on the graphics uh, elements. So that's displaying, uh, rendering, and processing. And now let's, let's look at um, the hardware components that are used for these things uh, more specifically. So first of all, uh, let's look at the display hardware. So that's kind of important to understand later on uh, how the software, uh, what the software has to do and what it has to coordinate. So uh, among the display hardware, uh, we basically have a pipeline of different elements that are combined to kind of uh, feed pixels, which are initially stored in a frame buffer. So that's just a memory buffer with the pixels that we want to stream to a uh, monitor or a panel or a projector. So to do that, we're first going to use a display engine, uh, which is really a hardware compositor. So it might take different sources of pixels, of frame buffers. Um, then it will assign a position on the final, uh, on the final picture that it's going to send. Um, so this assignment is done through what we call planes. So planes have a position, a size, and so on uh, on the final picture. So once we have a composited picture that is ready to be sent, we're going to pipe it through a timings controller, uh, which is responsible for uh, basically feeding the pixel at the correct rate that is expected by the other side, so the monitor. This is important to be backwards compatible with the cathode ray tube monitors, which required very specific timings uh, to be able to drive the electron gun uh, that would be uh, sending the, pixel, the pixels on the phosphorescent screen uh, that kind of recreates uh, the light. So nowadays, all of the display hardware is still backwards compatible with that. So we have very uh, specific timings that need to be respected. 
then uh, after after the timings are, are are done and after our pixels are are correctly formatted to follow these timings, we can uh, send them through a display protocol controller. So this implements some logic uh, to correctly, uh, let's say, wrap or packet the pixels in the, the format that is expected. So for example, if you're using DisplayPort, you have to split the pixels into different packets and, and send them with specific headers and so on. Uh, then we have the file layer, which is really the physical layer that will handle the modulation of the signal that actually goes on the cable. Uh, for example, if you're using HDMI, the file layer is uh, implementing TMDS, which is Transition Minimized uh, Differential Signaling. It's uh, just a way of encapsulating the bits that we're going to send in the physical link. Uh, just so that uh, it won't be prone to noise uh, thanks to differential signaling. Then finally, we have the connector and the cable uh, that we actually plug to the monitor. So on the pictures below, uh, you can see a graphics card on the left, uh, then a display panel uh, on the bottom, and on the right, we have a cathode ray tube monitor. So usually the graphics card will include pretty much uh, all of the elements from the display engine to the uh, phi. So that was for display. Um, now if we take a closer look at rendering, uh, we can basically find a, a number of different uh, types of hardware to do rendering. So the most common one is the GPU or graphics processing unit. So the idea of the GPU is that we have a highly specialized architecture with a speci specific instruction set architecture, which uh, is really designed to do uh, 3D rendering. So it can do all sorts of 3D calculation and so on. Um, and it can also be used for 2D, as we're going to see a bit later. So this GPU is loaded with small programs that we call shaders. And it's configured with something we call the common stream, which is basically a, a binary uh, a series of instructions that the GPU is going to be able to understand, to correctly uh, configure its pipeline, and eventually be able to produce pixels uh, from this configuration. Then we have another type of hardware implementation, which is the DSPs, so digital signal processors. Um, these are much more similar to CPUs or microcontrollers, uh, but they also have a very specialized I, uh, instruction set architecture, so uh, it's actually quite efficient to do um, rendering and also processing on these. And usually they will run a specific firmware or a specific real-time operating system. Then another approach is to use the fixed function uh, image signal processors, which are really just hardware implementations that are dedicated to a very specific task. And so in this case, uh, unlike the GPUs and DSPs, we don't have any software running in that. It's just a purely hardware design uh, that does uh, image signal processing. So it's kind of common for processing and not very much for rendering. And then finally, we can have the CPU-based uh, implementations uh, to do the rendering and processing operations, which might uh, use specific features of the CPU, like single instruction, multiple data, which is kind of a good fit for these uh, pixel-based operations of, of rendering and, and processing. OK, so now that we have some idea of the hardware uh, that we uh, can use for that, uh, let's take a look at the software and especially some, some specific concepts uh, that apply to graphics uh, software components. So let's begin with display again. So one important thing to understand is that once we have a display, we can only send a single picture to the display uh, or a limited number of pictures that will be composited by the display engine. So it's very important that only one program at a time uh, drives the display. Because otherwise, if you have multiple programs that try to use the display concurrently, 
uh, you're going to see alternating flashing uh, in display, uh, well pictures that don't have anything to do with each other and it's going to be very confusing. So uh, just because we want continuity in time, uh, we want a single uh, application or program to access the display at one time. So this is why a very important component was introduced, uh, which is the display server. So the display server is this one component that will be driving the display. And because we also want uh, any number of application to uh, contribute, let's say, to the picture that is uh, on the display, uh, this display server implements a specific protocol for the clients to uh, connect to the display server and to um, provide their buffers that they want to display. Uh, and so then the display server is in charge of gathering all these buffers and coordinating that. Now it's also in charge of managing the input events uh, because as you know, uh, input is correlated to display. So especially for the mouse, uh, when you move the mouse, uh, this has to be correlated on the display. And uh, when you type in on the keyboard, you also only want a single application to receive uh, these events. So you don't want, for example, when you're typing your password, you don't want all of the applications to receive the password, but only the one uh, that you uh, currently have in focus, for example. So you can see that the display server is also quite critical for security concerns, and so it's responsible for doing isolation between the different uh, components. Then another component that is sometimes part of the display server is the compositor. So it's really in charge of gathering all the different buffers and producing a final picture to send to the display hardware. And then finally, we have a window manager, which will define the policy between these different clients. So it will say uh, which application goes on top of which, which application is selected, which application uh, is being moved, and so on. So for render now, uh, the situation is a little bit different because we don't have this uh, exclusivity problem. Uh, when we're rendering uh, pictures, we can render different pictures at the same time in parallel. So this is the case with GPUs. And so um, now GPU rendering is, is based uh, on, on using primitives, which I've mentioned a bit already. So these are uh, vertices, which are just the name we give to points in 3D. So vertices, lines between these vertices, and triangles made of the different lines. So they all have positions in 3D. And so these, this is used to kind of create geometry and create shapes in 3D that the GPU is going to render uh, uh, in a final flat 2D uh, frame buffer. So we can also use textures to apply on, on, those, on that geometry. And also what we call maps, uh, which are just like textures, except that they uh, provide internal information for calculation instead of uh, being purely uh, visual elements that we want to apply on, on the geometry. So in order for GPUs to do this rendering, um, we have programs, so they are called shaders that basically coordinate what's going on. And there are different types of shaders. Uh, the most important ones are vertex shaders, which can apply transformations to the geometry in 3D space. And they are also involved with lighting. And then finally, we, we have also the, the fragment shaders, uh, which will basically define the final color that is applied uh, on the final picture. But there are also more advanced shaders, for example, uh, tessellation shaders, which allow modifying the geometry uh, in a quite fine way. So the thing to really understand is that shaders are kind of small programs that are compiled on the fly and that are uh, um, uh, provided to the GPU hardware as part of the command stream. Okay, so now that we have a quite a precise idea about the different aspects of graphics and the different uh, hardware components that are involved with graphics, let's uh, take a look at the Linux and user space graphics stack. Uh, 
So we're going to begin with uh, the displaying stack, so to drive the monitors and the, the panels. So on the kernel side, um, there was a first interface that was called FBDev. Well, it's, it's actually still, uh, it still exists. So FBDev, um, which was kind of the first attempt uh, to support displays. Uh, it's very limited and uh, it has lots of uh, issues. So for example, you cannot configure the pipeline, uh, it doesn't support hot plugging, uh, it only pre-allocates buffers, which is quite a, a serious limitation, and it also has synchronization issues, so it's kind of hard to uh, make changes to the, the frame buffer um, synchronously with the refresh of the display. But this is still used, for example, for the on-display console that you see when you uh, boot up the computer or when you're using a uh, TTY uh, console session. So this is still using FBDev. But now we have a more advanced and more relevant uh, interface for today's hardware, which is called DRM KMS. So DRM is the Direct Rendering Manager and KMS stands for Kernel Mode Setting. So DRM KMS is basically the part of DRM that deals with uh, display. So uh, KMS is much more advanced than FBDev uh, because you can configure each element of the pipeline separately. Uh, you, can, you have lots of flexibility in terms of how you connect things together and so on. Um, it also has a, a generic UAPI uh, which uh, means that a, a basically a, a, any implementation, any user space implementation of DRM can work with any DRM uh, driver. Uh, and it also has a flexible property-based system that can be used to kind of configure uh, different, different switches and different elements separately. So it, it doesn't have the limitations of FBDev in terms of frame buffer management, so you can uh, allocate frame buffers as you want, and uh, you don't have to write to the same memory area, especially if it's being displayed. So this is great for synchronization. Uh, then there's a quite recent API that was introduced, which is called the Atomic API. And this one basically allows uh, grouping and synchronizing changes uh, to the display hardware. So this can be useful, for example, if we want to configure multiple monitors at a time and we don't want to have any intermediate states. Uh, it's also useful if we want to use multiple planes, so multiple frame buffers uh, on the same display, and we want to update these planes uh, synchronously, and again, we don't want to have any intermediate states. So this wasn't possible before, uh, but now with the Atomic API, this is something that, that can be achieved. Um, DRM also has a compatibility layer with uh, FBDev, so this is why uh, you can have a frame buffer console if you have a DRM driver. So DRM will basically register itself as a FBDev driver, so you have this backwards compatibility. Now finally, another subsystem of the kernel that is involved is TTY. So <clears throat> When you start up your uh, system with the Linux kernel, uh, initially all the, the all you have on the on the screen is the frame buffer console uh, with a TTY, so that's a a, a kind of a, a, a terminal, um, and if you want to start a graphic session, you have to ask the kernel to detach uh, fbcon, so to detach this frame buffer console. So this is the graphics mode switch uh, that can be done using some IOCTL that the display server will call. And then when you, when you want to switch between the different virtual terminals, so when you're doing control alt and F, F3, F4, F5, whatever, uh, then you, the kernel is going to coordinate what we call VT switching which is this idea that uh, we're going to ask the display server to release the display so that uh, the frame buffer console can uh, basically come back and, and take ownership of the display. Uh, 
And so this allows running multiple graphic sessions in parallel. So basically, you can have one graphic session per uh, virtual terminal. So um, this is quite nice if you want to run multiple display servers and multiple desktop environments in parallel. OK, so now that we've seen the kernel, uh, we're going to look at the user space side for display. And we're going to begin with X. So X is the uh, historic display server project that was used with the Linux kernel and, and uh, user space. So um, X11 is the protocol that, that is uh, the latest version of the protocol that is in use. So uh, it's not actually an implementation because the implementation is called Xorg. Um, <clears throat> so X11 is just a protocol. But this protocol is actually quite old and quite ancient already. Uh, and so it was completed with, completed with uh, multiple protocol extensions. So for example, x r which allows uh, dynamic configuration uh, of the displays, which wasn't possible before. Uh, before, you needed to statically configure the X server uh, to use your different monitors, for example. And then you would need to restart the server for the changes to be applied. Uh, with x r it's now possible to do it dynamically. Then we have XSHM for shared memory, which allows uh, avoiding copies of, of, of uh, pixel buffers, which is nice for performance. Uh, and then more extensions. Uh, there are actually lots, lots more than the ones I've listed here. So X uh, uses a concept of drivers for the inputs and display parts. So for example, there was one driver for uh, DRMKMS, which is called XF86 Video Mode Setting. And there is one for FBDev, which is called XF86 Video FBDev. And you have the same with inputs, with, for example, libinput library. <coughs> so X is known to have lots of limitations and lots of security issues as well. So it's really not encouraged to use it anymore. Uh, it's not really adapted to, let's say, modern day computers, even though all the protocol extensions kind of still make it somewhat relevant. Uh, but also for embedded uh, use cases, it's often not a very good fit uh, because it's also quite heavy and so, and so on. So the, uh, the X server is now being replaced with Wayland. So Wayland is this idea of a modern uh, display server, um, <clears throat> which was kind of designed as, as a, a better replacement for X, which doesn't have uh, the common limitations and issues that exist in X. So uh, one thing is that Wayland itself is uh, just a protocol specification. It's not an implementation. Uh, so lot different display servers will be implementing the Wayland protocol. And there are also extensions to the Wayland protocol, uh, which are optional, like the XDG shell extension, which allows uh, desktop environment integration. So the display servers that implement the Wayland protocol are called Wayland compositors. And an example of a Wayland compositor is Weston, and that's the reference implementation that was developed by the people who also um, created the Wayland protocol. So it's a very good way to kind of discover Wayland, and if you want to write a Wayland client or a Wayland display server, uh, looking at Western is a very good idea because it's really well written, it's very clear, and it also has lots of client examples. So it's a very, very good uh, thing to look at. Now, there are also other implementations uh, that exist besides Western. Um, so Sway is a, a, an i3-inspired uh, um, uh, display server using Wayland. Uh, it's using a library called WL Roots, which can also be reused to uh, create other uh, display servers. And then we have desktop environments that uh, implement the Wayland protocol in their own compositors. So for GNOME, that would be Matter, and for KDE, that would be KWIN. Uh, 
So Wayland is really, uh, it has lots of benefits over X. It's really more secure. It has much better isolation uh, between the clients. So you can trust that a client cannot access the, uh, the frame buffer of another client, which is uh, hardly the case with X. Uh, but Wayland is also uh, compatible with uh, X applications through X Wayland. So X Wayland is kind of a compatibility layer between Wayland and X. Uh, it's actually a, an X server that runs as a Wayland client. So even if you want to use Wayland, but you still have applications that use X and not Wayland, uh, it's still possible with X Wayland. So the migration can be kind of transparent. And nowadays, most of the GNU and Linux uh, distributions are uh, shipping Wayland, but enabling X Wayland for this compatibility. So uh, while we're talking about uh, user space display servers, I uh, also wanted to mention a few others that are uh, less known. So there is uh, Mir, which was Canonical's attempt at making a new display server. It was kind of a concurrent of Wayland. Uh, but this project was more or less abandoned nowadays because they have switched to Wayland like anybody else. Uh, but then there is also Surface Flinger, which is Android-specific display server. So this one is not meant to be used in, in GNU and Linux distributions, in, in traditional desktop environments. It's very, very specific to Android. Um, but it also implements a uh, display server. Now something else uh, I wanted to mention is the display managers. So the display managers are just simple programs, simple interfaces um, that, are start, that are launched at startup to allow users to log in. So this is kind of the login screen that you see. Um, these actually run in a display server as well. So it might be X or it might be a Welland uh, based, well, a Welland uh, protocol using implementation. So the idea is that these display managers are basically going to set up the sessions and start the desktop environment for users. So now, depending on your use case, it might be a bad fit to have a display manager. For example, on embedded, usually we don't use uh, display managers because we want the uh, graphics interface to start right away. OK, so now in this slide, I'm just giving you uh, a kind of a list of different libraries uh, that can be used in user space to kind of communicate with the display servers. So there are some low-level libraries uh, like uh, libwayland client and libwayland server for, for Wayland. And XCB, which is uh, the latest X11 protocol implementation, and Xlib, which is the old one. So this is very low-level uh, uh, libraries that uh, are not usually uh, used directly by the applications, but instead the applications will be using graphics toolkits such as uh, GTK or Qt or EFL, SDL. Uh, so these are uh, graphics toolkits um, um, and libraries, well, except SDL, which is not really a, a, a toolkit, but more of a, just a sim simpler API. Um, but the idea is that these will provide um, some, um, um, th they will basically wrap these low-level libraries into higher-level interfaces that are easier to use and uh, that also provide extra features like uh, drawing user interfaces. So then we have the concept of desktop environment that will use one of the graphics toolkits uh, to provide a desktop user interface as well as a number of base applications uh, that kind of give a coherent look and feel uh, to the uh, experience. And finally, another important library in user space is libdrm, uh, which is basically a thin wrapper around the uh, DRM uh, user space API, so this is what will wrap the calls to the actual uh, kernel drivers. Okay, so now let's take a look at the 3D rendering stack, um, <clears throat> starting with the kernel side. So this is also handled by DRM, just like for display. So DRM will manage the, the GPUs, uh, 
But unlike uh, KMS, unlike the DisplayPort, uh, there is no generic uh, user space API for uh, the render part, for the 3D or GPU related part. So it means that each render driver in DRM has its own API um, that is specific to that driver. So this is because the GPUs are uh, highly specific and it's nearly impossible to create a generic interface uh, between the kernel and user space for that. So the kernel side and the kernel drivers are in charge of a few low-level aspects, uh, but they don't actually do so much. Uh, this is mostly I.O. related tasks. So this includes memory buffer management. So these are called BOs or buffer objects. And this is using the gem API of DRM internally. Then another task is comment stream validation and submission. So user space will provide uh, different command streams that uh, will be validated by the, the kernel so that uh, uh, the kernel makes sure that the command stream won't try to access the, the, the data of uh, the other programs, other applications. And then it's going to submit that command stream to the GPU and ask it to uh, process that command stream. So this is done through different tasks uh, that are scheduled uh, with the DRM scheduler uh, or a scheduler specific to the driver. So the idea is just to coordinate between different, different clients, different applications that might need to use the GPU at the same time. And so they have to be given uh, time slots and, and so on. So um, this is for the DRM part, but usually for GPUs, uh, there are also uh, proprietary implementations that can exist, and these are not using DRM, they are using their own um, specific interfaces, which are found usually in either in downstream kernels, so uh, kernels that were modified by vendors or manufacturers to include their own, uh, um, their own drivers, their own GPU drivers, or it might be out of three drivers uh, that you can build against the, the official kernel and, and uh, use as modules. Okay, so this is for the kernel part. Uh, now we're going to look at the user space APIs for 3D rendering. So <clears throat> there are various different, uh, different APIs. And the most common one is uh, OpenGL. So OpenGL is in charge of providing a generic interface for using the GPUs. So this is what the applications that want to do 3D rendering uh, are actually going to use. Um, OpenGL is kind of a, a compromise between a, uh, a complex interface, so it's not, very, it's not that complex, uh, and the amount of control that we want to have. So uh, it's not very complex and it doesn't kind of offer full control over the device. So it's kind of a middle ground. Um, and this is why it's kind of well appreciated because it's not too complex, but it also offers uh, most of the features that we want to use from the GPU and it's not limiting either. So OpenGL works with a uh, stateful and context-based programming model. Uh, meaning that if you want to do something uh, to, to do an action, it has to be split up through multiple function calls. And the function calls uh, will have an effect that may depend on previous function calls. So it's like a context that you're building uh, through different uh, successive calls. Now, in order to send the shaders, uh, it has its own uh, shading language, which is called GLSL for GL shading language. So this is just a language that looks a little bit like C and that allows describing the small programs, so the shaders, uh, that will be compiled and sent to the GPU. So OpenGL itself mostly targets the desktop GPUs, uh, but a, a kind of derivative version of OpenGL was created for embedded GPUs and it's called OpenGL ES. So it is kind of a simplified version of OpenGL, but actually the two are, are, are fairly close. And it's not uncommon that a GPU that does OpenGL, yes, is actually also capable of doing OpenGL. Uh, 
So OpenGL and OpenGL ES are for the rendering part, uh, but something quite important with GPU rendering is also how the results, like the uh, produced picture, uh, picture from the GPU, uh, is integrated with the rest of the display stack. So this is done with an API that is kind of uh, in between rendering and displaying, and this interface is called EGL. So it's really responsible for uh, providing buffers that can be sent to the display components, like the display server. Um, <clears throat> and so EGL provides functions that can be integrated with OpenGL API, and that will link to uh, to display server protocols like, like X11 or Wayland, but also Android. So there was a previous interface for X that kind of served uh, the same purpose, which was GLX, uh, and now it's considered deprecated. So even if you are using X11 and you want to do uh, 3D rendering, it's much better to use EGL instead of GLX. And now finally, there is a kind of uh, more recent API, which is called Vulkan. So Vulkan is really meant for very advanced GPU usage. Uh, because it's a very low-level API that gives you uh, very fine-grained control over the GPU, uh, but it also means that uh, it requires a lot more code and a lot more efforts to kind of uh, get something out of the GPU. So it's using a direct programming model, meaning that you basically have long function calls with many arguments that kind of all specify uh, the operation that you're doing. Uh, memory management is also very low level, so it doesn't have the same abstractions as OpenGL, so you kind of have to be doing more and more, and it's easier to make mis mistakes also. And for um, display stack integration, uh, Vulkan actually has its own system that is called Vulkan WSI for Windows system integration, so it doesn't use EGL. But uh, since Vulkan is much lower level. Uh, it can actually be used to do more than 3D rendering. So for example, you can use it for general purpose GPU, uh, which is uh, compute. So like uh, you can accelerate uh, general purpose calculation using the GPU, uh, using the Vulkan API. Now for the shaders, a difference with OpenGL is that OpenGL will take uh, shaders in source form in uh, GLSL, and Vulkan will take uh, shaders in a kind of pre-built format that we call an intermediate representation um, in a format that we call SPEAR-V. Uh, so this is yeah kind of a, a pre, uh, pre-processed representation of the shaders, and so because it's not directly the source, you can imagine that uh, it's faster to provide these intermediate representations. Um, and so there is less uh, handling and less treatment to be done by the, uh, um, the library that uh, compiles the shaders. So talking about this library uh, that compiles the shader, um, this is the user space implementation for the rendering stack. So before I've only mentioned the APIs, but uh, these APIs are, are implemented by a specific 3D user space implementations. So the, the, the free software one is called Massa 3D, and it's really the reference, and there's basically no other free software uh, reference rendering library the, for GPUs. So it supports all of the, the APIs that I've just mentioned, and, and basically uh, it uses the DRM kernel side, to, uh, to communicate with the actual hardware. So basically, each, um, each hardware that has a driver in DRM, render, is also supported by Mesa. So we have uh, examples that I've listed below, like uh, Radeon, uh, AMD GPU, Nuvo, Etnoviv, uh, VC4, V3D, which are for the Raspberry Pi, or Lima and Penfrost, which are for the ARM Mali GPUs. But uh, Mesa 3D also implements software backends, uh, which can be used if you don't actually have a GPU, like a hardware GPU, but you want to, uh, to, do, to, to, to do 3D rendering or to use these uh, APIs. Uh, then there are CPU-based implementation that, that Mesa provides. 
Uh, it can also help with uh, video decoding acceleration because sometimes the GPUs have specific blocks to accelerate video decoding. And so Mesa will also provide access to those blocks through APIs like VDPO, VA API, or OMX. And then finally, I've mentioned general purpose uh, GPU usage just before, and this is also something that Mesa 3D is kind of starting to support with the Clover driver on Intel. Uh, but in the future, maybe more, uh, more hardware will be supported and this will also allow um, accelerating general purpose calculation through APIs like OpenCL. Now in the case of proprietary implementations, um, the uh, uh, libraries are secret and the user space is uh, always proprietary software, so we don't know what it does or how it works and we can't modify it and, and so on. Okay, so now I've mentioned the uh, 3D rendering part. Um, now let's take kind of a look at 2D. So usually 2D is done <clears throat> uh, with CPU-based implementations, but it's also possible to use the GPU uh, to, to do 2D rendering as well. So here I've put a number of reference libraries that are used. Uh, for example, Cairo and Kia are used to do general drawing or rasterization, so this is like drawing shapes and, and things like this. Uh, these two are, are really widely, widely used. Um, then there is font rendering, where there are two major libraries. Uh, the first one is free type, and the second one is called uh, half buzz. So th these two allow rendering fonts, which look really, really nice, um, <clears throat> from uh, basically vector descriptions uh, into uh, actual pixel uh, pictures. Then for user interfaces, there are also different libraries that exist uh, that can be used. Uh, so the, the first type are really the big and kind of complex um, <coughs> retained mode uh, drawing, well, uh, interface toolkits. So that's, for example, GTK or Qt or EFL. So these have lots of functionalities, lots of widgets that you can use. And then there are more simple, which are also called immediate mode GUIs. So these are uh, simpler implementations and they don't work the same as the previous one because they will basically redraw the whole uh, user interface each time, which can be a good fit, for example, for games. So uh, you have examples there as well. Whip. Okay, so now finally, uh, a few uh, examples of processing libraries. So usually processing is also implemented in CPU, but uh, it can also sometimes leverage the uh, 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 parallel instructions of, of CPUs, so SIMD. And finally, it's also sometimes possible to use the GPU for, for processing uh, using specific shaders. So there are various libraries that exist to help with processing. A uh, very common one is FFmpeg's uh, libsw scale, which allows doing pixel format conversion as well as scaling. Another one uh, is Pixman that is really used a lot. It allows uh, doing some pixel operations. Uh, and then I've also put a few other examples of uh, uh, implementations like any 10 which is specific to ARM processors with neon accelerated uh, implementations uh, and, and so on. So if you want to kind of take a, a look at the uh, uh, graphic stack to have an overview, uh, we can see on the right side we have the rendering part. So within the example of a proprietary driver that will use its own uh, interface between user space and the kernel, also its own kernel driver. Then we have the case of Mesa 3D, which will use DRM in the kernel. Um, <clears throat> then Mesa 3D might be used by uh, uh, applications directly, uh, and the applications will coordinate with the display parts using EGL. So. We have example, uh, examples of applications that can be either native Wayland clients or 
uh, X clients that go through X Wayland. Then in this case, the display server is a Wayland compositor. And this Wayland compositor is going to be using DRM KMS for the display part. And also the input interface of the kernel that is called um, EVDev. Okay, so I'm skipping the final slide uh, because I'm running out of time. So um, that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, now if you have uh, questions or remarks that you would like to share, uh, we might still have a few minutes and I will uh, answer them in the chat. So thanks again. Uh, and if you want to write me or, or, uh, or just let me know of, of anything, I've also put my email on, on the slides. So feel free. Cheers. <laughs>